great to be here. Thank you, Randy, for making that possible. Welcome to everyone. And I'm an ethnobotanist. That's a scientist who works with indigenous peoples in the rainforest to document the uses of local plants. And I'm here to tell you, in terms of thinking outside the box, that turning to people that many of us would consider the most primitive on the planet for answers to questions we can't solve, whether it's incurable diseases, incurable by our medicine, or uh, climate change and many things in between, is a sort of a back to the future approach. Now, I've been working with these people in these forests for a very long time. I started over 30 years ago, and it's created a relationship with these indigenous colleagues, unlike that that most scientists have the honor and pleasure to have. Now, is this on auto timer? Because this is advancing without me touching it. Let's make sure I'm in charge of the images. This is me and my friend Kamanya in the Northeast Amazon, 1984. This is the very same fellows, same pose. Now it's not advancing. 30 years later. As a friend of mine pointed out, well, your notebook got a lot bigger. And as I pointed out, as the brain shrinks, the notebook must get bigger. <laughs> now, I did a TED Talk in Brazil about a year ago, and as soon as I was finished, I packed my bags, went to the Northeast Amazon, and gave the talk in the tribal language to my colleagues. Here I'm surrounded by shamans and apprentices. And to my right, the fellow with the headlamp is Kamanya, the fellow I just showed you. And in the course of giving my talk, I showed a picture of the magic frog. This is the combo frog. This was found by my friend Lauren McIntyre, who was lost on the Brazil-Peru border 30 years ago, was rescued by a group of uncontacted Indians who beckoned for him to follow them deeper in the forest. He followed them in, they took out palm leaf baskets and took out these giant green monkey frogs, these are big suckers, and began licking them. It turns out they're highly hallucinogenic. This account was read by another friend of mine who at the Times was editor of High Times magazine. You see, ethnobotanists have friends in all sorts of strange cultures. And he decided he would go down to the Amazon and give it a whirl or give it a lick, which he did. And he did, and he said, and I quote, or he wrote, and I quote, my heartbeat went through the roof, I lost full control of my bodily functions, I passed out in a hammock, I woke up six hours later, I felt like God for two days. Now, an Italian chemist read this account and said, well, I'm not really interested in the theological aspects of the green monkey frog, but I'm interested in the change in blood pressure. So they're developing new blood pressure medicines based on compounds in the green monkey frog. When I showed this to Kamanya, he said, but this frog is in our forest. I said, no, it's in Peru, 3,000 miles to the west of here. He said, no, it's here, and we use it for hunting magic as well. And I said, I've been here for 30 years, and you didn't tell me. He said, you've been here for 30 years, and you didn't ask me which shows that our Western approach of trying to get things done in a hurry doesn't always pan out. This is an ayahuasca shaman from the Colombian Amazon. I took him to meet a foundation in Los Angeles, and the foundation officer, who spoke pretty good Spanish, turned to him and said, you're a medicine man, huh? He said, you didn't go to medical school, did you? And he said, of course not. And he says, well, what could you possibly know about healing? And the shaman smiled, and he looked at him, and he said, you know, if you get an infection, go to a doctor. He said, but many human afflictions or diseases of the heart, the mind, and the soul. Western medicine can't touch those. I cure them. This is the most important image I'm going to show you. This is taken, I took this from a little plane flying over the Shingu Reserve in the Brazilian Amazon. Top of the picture is where the Indians live. Bottom of the picture is where the white men live. The line through the middle is the border of the reserve. On the top, you have 14 tribes of Indians. On the bottom, you don't have a single tree, just a couple of skinny-ass cows. Top of the forest, top of the picture, beautiful forest, carbon sequestered. Bottom of the picture, white guys, no forest. Destruction of forests is the number two cause of putting carbon in the atmosphere. And if you live in Naples, Florida, and you're not concerned about climate change and sea level rise, you should move back to the Midwest. How to protect it? Here is a trio Indian with a GPS, okay? Learning how to map as lands, learning how to use cutting edge of technology. This is what we do. This allows these people to take charge of their cultural environmental destiny. It's the perfect marriage of ancient shamanic wisdom and 21st century US know-how. Let me show you, thinking back of Alvi Ray's talk, how technology is improving. We started mapping in the year 2000. At the time, a single one of our pixels was uh, 30 meters across. 
as of last month? A single pixel starting with 30 meters across, a single pixel today is 30 centimeters across. So it's using our technology once again to allow these people to take charge of their cultural and environmental destiny in a way that protects their knowledge, their medicine, their forests, and keeps the carbon on the ground and out of the atmosphere. So let's go to the Northeast Amazon, where I've worked for over three decades, and visit the land of the Okorios. The Okorios are one of the last hunter-gatherer tribes. This is what it looks like when they come out of the forest. Now, by our standards, these people must be termed primitive in the sense that they didn't know how to make fire. They had to carry it with them from campsite to campsite. But the trios, the plant masters that I start out showing you, a single shaman will know 300 medicinal plants, and they look up to these hunter-gatherer, isolated peoples as the true masters of the forest. The Okorios have 35 words for honey. When I was a teenager growing up in my native town of New Orleans, Pone, the Okorio, was tromping through the rainforest of the Northeast Amazon, campsite to campsite, in search of a wife, in search of medicinal plants, in search of the sustenance that sustained him. Unfortunately, in most of the Amazon, that's all that's left of uncontacted tribes, these carving groups where they used to sharpen their stone axes. These people who once roamed these forests, collected medicinal plants, knew these ecosystems far better than anybody trained at Harvard or Yale or Oxford or Cambridge, who danced, who prayed to the gods, who made love, who hunted. All that's left is this mute evidence in stone. And what once roamed through the forest, people that once roamed through the forest, isolated tribes, is now down to a handful. We estimate there are about 70 uncontacted groups as seen here. Why are they isolated? They know the outside world exists. This is a form of passive resistance. They want to be left alone. Certainly some of the stems from 1492, but also uh, the Casa Arana atrocities, the turn of the last century when the world went crazy for rubber. There was only one place to get rubber, it was the Amazon basin. And thugs like Julio Cesar Arana, who ran the Casa Arana, tortured, enslaved, mutilated, and murdered tribes like the Huitotos here in search of that white gold, white gold that fueled the Industrial Revolution for bicycle tires, for zeppelins, for conveyor belts. The Indians paid the price, and it was only with bringing rubber to Southeast Asia and growing it in plantation that these Indians' lives were saved. But even today, when the last of the uncontacted tribes come out, the result is seldom happy. These are new cocks who brought out of the rainforest in Colombia about 15 years ago. Within a year, everybody over the age of 40 was dead. And remember, in these preliterate cultures, the elders are the libraries. So all that 50,000 years of accumulated wisdom of how to heal and how to cure disappears every time a shaman disappears as well. This is my mentor, Richard Evan Schultes, the great ethnobotanist from Harvard, seen here atop the sacred Bell Mountain in the Northeast Amazon, 1943. Nobody has climbed this since. And if I can raise the money, I'll be back there in two months. But here's why that's important. Same scene, I took this in doing the aerial reconnaissance to set up the uh, expedition. That's the Bell Mountain on the left. It's important because, based on Schulte's work, we know this is the richest repository of pre-Columbian art in the world. We know there's 200,000 drawings. We think there's 900,000 drawings, and nobody's been back on the ground where he was since 1943. Chiribiquete is therefore a treasure trove, A, of biodiversity, there's disease-resistant rubber, B, cultural diversity, three tribes of uncontacted peoples, and C, artistic treasures as well. We have partnered with the Colombian government to double the size of Chiribiquete Park in the Northwest Amazon to protect the plants, the animals, and the uncontacted tribes, the yellow areas where the uncontacted peoples live. To the trained eye, you can look at the malocas, the longhouses from the air, and discern if these are different cultures, which they are based on the palms they use to weave the malocas and based on the size and the shape. So we definitely know they're out there. And as I said, we've designed the legislation with our Colombian colleagues, passed it, and worked very closely with the President of Colombia and his people to enact the legislation. 
We've established guard houses outside of the uncontacted people's lands to prevent bad guys, gold miners, Chinese loggers, uh, from getting in there. So it's all about protecting the people, their wisdom, their plants, their knowledge, their headwaters, something that benefits all of us. And here's the secret sauce, not the uncontacted peoples themselves, the contacted people. These are forest Indians that we have trained as forest rangers, and they patrol the borders and keep the outside world at bay. So they can earn a living not having to go to the gold fields, not having to move to the capital cities, the slums of which are all, the, the uh, cities of which are all ringed by slums that we've all seen in our travels in the tropics. This is why you don't mess with uncontacted Indians. <laughs> this is a picture I dearly love. This is actually an art exhibit in Havana, Cuba, done by a group of artists of why you shouldn't mess with uncontacted tribes. The downside is the outside world is moving in. The downside of technology, it gives everybody access to these people, certainly aerial and visual technology to find out where these people are, find out where these forests are. And the race is on to help them protect themselves, protect their forest for themselves and ultimately for us. These are Mashkopiros in Peru that came out of isolation because they were chased out by Garimperos, Brazilian gold miners, who shot them, who shot at them, who set their malocas, their longhouses, on fire because they wanted their rivers full of gold. So the idea that these people are coming out of the forest in search for a better life is not true. The ones that are coming out are being chased out by disease, by weapons, by people who want to steal their resources. Killing isolated peoples with automatic weapons has to be considered one of the grossest violations of human rights anywhere on the planet. And here's the big reveal for today. This was taken 10 days ago. This is by Digital Globe. To the trained eye, we know what this means. So let's zoom in. Another roundhouse, another uncontacted tribe. Isolated and uncontacted peoples hold a mystical and iconic role in our imagination. These are the people that really know the forest. And if we can help them and the contacted Indians and the local governments protect their culture, protect those forests, protect those water sources. Ultimately, we're protecting ourselves. Because conservation is not just about endangered species. It's about better medicine for everyone, better agricultural products and biodegradable pesticides for everyone, new industrial products for everyone used in a renewable way. Conservation is not just about these people, and it's not just about these forests. It's about us as well. Thank you very much.